Well, it's the 20th review. I'm surprised I've kept the show going this long, but here we are, so while we're here, it's time to celebrate. For this landmark review, let's pick a landmark game. Hmm. Aha, I've got it. It's a game that deals with traveling across the United States, from the East Coast to Oregon, in a wagon, taking yourself and four other adventurers to hopefully find a more settled and less dangerous life. A journey that will require brave, brave souls, and plenty of ammo. This is Oregon Trail. Wait, what? What's that dirty look for? Oh, you thought I said Oregon Trail. Haha, <laughs> psych. Oregon Trail was developed in 1971 by the men who wear many hats as a training tool to prepare children for the impending zombie apocalypse. Or at least, that's what the website says. Actually, Oregon Trail started off as a free Flash game released on Halloween 2011, and it evolved into the more fleshed out director's cut in 2012, six months later, which is what I'm reviewing. Also, the original Oregon Trail is actually called THE Oregon Trail, just for information's sake. Not that anyone cares, you'll still call it Oregon Trail, and I'll still call it Oregon Trail, just because it's easier. And another thing, Oregon Trail kinda goes for the retro feel, and while the graphics are very reminiscent of the Apple II, the sound is much more modern. Just to let you know. Not that it's a bad thing, but I'm still pointing that out. Also, a real Apple II would never run at 30 frames per second, but I digress. Basically, Oregon Trail is like the original Oregon Trail, but with zombies. But don't dismiss the addition of zombies as a completely minor addition. The zombies and much more dickish survivors actually introduce different mechanics to the game, keeping this from being a complete Oregon Trail clone. And besides, if you wanted new Oregon Trail related games around the time this was made, it was this, or the Facebook version of Oregon Trail. Yeah, I thought the choice was pretty obvious too. The basic idea, though, is the same. You're going from the East Coast clear up to Oregon in a wagon. In this case, it just happens to be a station wagon. You travel with four friends, family members, or just random people you feel like traveling with. Me, I'm taking my friends with me. Because if I'm going to take anybody with me, it's going to be my friends. Hmm, a tiger, two foxes, and a lemur. Suddenly the little mousy doesn't feel that safe anymore. Anyway, starting up the game, you're fighting off some zombies, probably from your house. You run out of ammo very quickly for some reason, and you're saved by an old priest named Clements. If you weren't, for some reason, dumb enough to only carry four or five bullets around, you wouldn't need saving. But, cutscene incompetence aside, you introduce yourself, tell him who you think you can count on, which is all basically your character entry, and then you go and find a working station wagon, barely working, and head to Washington, D.C. For some reason, poor Clements has all kinds of things happen to him in that short little drive. Broken arm, dysentery, and bitten by a zombie. DC is supposed to be a safe haven, but if you know anything about zombie stories, the first place you head to to get to safety is never safe. In this case, it happens to be the exact opposite of safe. The government has declared Washington DC a Class 3 biohazard and decided to nuke it. You'll actually notice this seems to be their standby solution. It's the reason the Central Plains is now a fresh nuclear wasteland and the reason for the roundabout route you have to take. And the Central Plains will undoubtedly be the setting for a Fallout game now. So, Clements gives you his journal so you have some tips on what to scavenge, and depending on difficulty, you have a certain number of hours to gather your initial supplies while Clements goes to look for your friends. Anywhere from a plentiful 18 hours on easy, to 12 on normal, 8 on difficult, and a very scant 4 on suicide. You know me, I have to make up a reason for why you only have 4 hours to gather supplies on suicide. I have to imagine, you had a big huge party last night, you know, hangover and whatnot. You slept in too late and you only realize the zombie apocalypse is happening as you wake up in the middle of the day. You rub your eyes, make sure it's not a hallucination, and then you haul ass to Washington DC. Either that, or the current US administration is just really, really eager to fling the nukes around. With Obama's viewpoint, it's probably not that administration, so this has to take place in a different time period. Your difficulty also seems to affect the spawn rate of items when you're scavenging. It might also affect the frequency of random events, but I don't think it does. 
They just tend to affect you a little more when you have less supplies to work with. The good events feel even better, and the bad events really, really suck. Especially losing something like fuel or medkits. As for what to scavenge at the beginning, well, you absolutely need fuel to move, so there is that. And you have to have some amount of ammo to survive the zombies. But aside from that, what you gather to start with is your personal opinion. I say you don't need initial food or money, you can scavenge it along the way. Medkits and car parts are both useful, as well as making good trading items, and you can't just randomly find them. Well, you can find any item randomly, but not reliably via scavenging. If a car part breaks and you don't have a spare, you have to hope you can get a good trade for one. The scavenging works a lot like the hunting in the original Oregon Trail. You move around with the keyboard and you use the mouse to shoot. You kind of drag with the mouse to shoot, it takes a little getting used to. Unlike the original, you need not fire a bullet to collect anything. In fact, if you go during the low activity midday hours and you get lucky enough to avoid the zombies, you can end up using no bullets while you're scavenging. If you happen to run into the zombie hounds or bear though, you might be using a few bullets. The dogs can be killed and pretty much have to if you don't want to die. The bear cannot. If you trap the bear behind a tree or a wall, you don't have to waste too many bullets slowing it down. Also, there is a lot of references to other zombie movies and games in this game. The most obvious one once your friends join the party is Shaun of the Dead, but... I'm not very well versed in movies, mostly games. I mean, I'm the gamer mouse, I'm kind of a game nut. But... We'll see what references I spot along the way. When you're done getting supplies, you find out Clements is concerned about, well, turning Zed. So he asks you to put him down, letting you keep his journal for help along the way. After capping him in the head, or if you're feeling like a jackass in the balls, you and your party start your long, perilous journey towards Safe Haven in Oregon. No, not a Safe Haven, the place is called Safe Haven. Unfortunately for you, as I kind of hinted at earlier, your station wagon is a total lemon, so you continue to have to repair it with scrap. What is scrap? I don't know, I just imagine the whole car is made entirely of duct tape by the end of the game. You know, like that Mythbusters episode. Unlike the original Oregon Trail, your pace affects your car, not your party. The faster you go, the faster your car breaks down, but you use the same amount of fuel per hour no matter what your speed is, so going faster is more fuel efficient. So use more fuel or use more scrap. Pick your poison. Now, your own health and how zombification works in here is a little bit strange. Just like the original Oregon Trail, different random things can happen. Broken limbs, diseases, or in here, things like bandits and zombie bites too. Luckily, no one seems to just wander off and disappear at random, so this game seems a little less cheap than the original. Just like the original, your party's health goes down a set amount every tick, in the original every day, in this case every hour, depending on the ration size. If you're using large rations, none at all but you have to have a lot of food for that. If they're sick, have the zombie virus, or both, their health goes down faster. Other injuries just immediately take a chunk of health away. Resting will recover everyone's health, much more so if you're at a landmark or city. Except for your own health. Your own health is a little bit of a strange case, it doesn't go down naturally at all. In exchange for this strange ability, your health doesn't increase naturally either. You can only heal via medkits, and yes, they look like the medkits from Left 4 Dead. I think if you're the last one left, your health might work like normal, but I've never been in a situation that dire in this game before. If someone runs out of health, they become incapped, and the only way to get them back is with a medkit. I'm not sure what happens if you leave someone incapped for too long, but it's probably not a good idea. What with the zombie virus going around and all. Also, they use more food when they're in capped, according to a stranger I talked to, so there is that. If you, the main character, run out of health, it's all over. Game over. Which really sucks, you should be able to play as another party member, I hate games that do that. If you're dead, there should still be hope for the other people. Strangely enough, getting the zombie virus is actually a strangely minor thing. In terms of health, it's basically a minor illness that you have all the time. There's only a risk of someone with the virus becoming a zombie if they're incapped, so now it's an even worse idea to leave them that way. If you can't heal them and they've got the zombie virus, you probably have to put them down. Yes, you can kill your party members in this game. Yes, you could do that while they're healthy, but why would you do that? You bastard. 
I don't care if they dicked around with a muffler and broke it or sat on a tire so hard it's unusable. What? How do you... But what? That can happen with anything, too. They can sit on anything, including a battery, or money, or ammo, so hard that you ruin it. If I sat on a car battery, I think it would hurt my ass, not the battery. But enough talk about asses. Your cross-country route will take you through various major cities and smaller landmarks, including places like a mall, Dawn of the Dead anyone, and a hospital, where you can actually see the reference to Left 4 Dead. Reference, not references, because this is one giant reference to Left 4 Dead. The characters, the pills, it's even called Mercy Hospital. The landmarks have a combat trainer where you can learn different random techniques that are available, including faster reload, faster bullets, no, the game doesn't even know how that works, and things like being able to very rarely find medkits while scavenging. The cities tend to have more items and supplies for sale, and they also have auto shops, where you can buy spare parts or even different car upgrades that all have different effects. I'm not even sure if I've seen all the upgrades that are possible, but so far the toolbox is by far my favorite. They give successful repair attempts twice the clout they would normally have, so it really saves on scrap. And time. Things like sand or snow tires, armored windows, more durable or even invincible batteries and tires, and other upgrades are also randomly available. There's even a V8 engine which makes you go even faster than normal, but your car becomes even more of a lemon. Yikes, even more car breakdown, that's a scary thought. Although I suppose if you combined the V8 engine and the toolbox, I bet you could do a good speed run with that. All of these things cost money though, but what else do you need money for? It's green paper. You can also buy and sell normal supplies too, courtesy of Resident Evil 4's merchant. This merchant is kind of a dick though. You spend way, way more money buying things than you get if you sell them. And just like the original, the farther along the trail you are, the more expensive things get, so keep that in mind. I only ever buy things from him if I really need to. You can also trade in cities or on the road, and you can take jobs for different rewards. On the road, you'll run into random events. Some are good, some are bad, some make you gain items, some make you lose items. You know, it's the standard fare for something like Oregon Trail. But you also have choose-your-own-adventure-style events you run into, too. Some of them are pretty funny, some of them are kinda creepy. Some have the same outcomes every time, others have different outcomes each time you run into them. But I don't even think I've seen all of these random choose-your-own-adventure events. And I've played through this game multiple times, and each time I seem to run into something new. It's actually kind of remarkable that this much work was put into an Oregon Trail game for the dialogue. You'll also run into tombstones which you can search. Either you'll find something useful, or you'll have to waste a bullet on a zombie. Yes, the hand that comes out of the grave is the hand from the Left 4 Dead box cover. Given that you can find things like a medkit or a car part at the graves, I usually say go for it. If there's nothing there, all you lose is a bullet anyways, unless you're a terrible aim. There's hundreds of different tombstones you can find too, and that's not even counting the ones that you can leave behind. Yes, that feature from the original carried over, leaving a tombstone in case of a total party kill. I accidentally got myself killed on suicide difficulty, so I know from experience. Speaking of which, the game should give you a warning if you'll die from getting attacked before you scavenge. I guess you just have to keep a close eye on your health. Aside from that, I've only had someone besides me die once in a normal game, and that was through a bad shot on my part. The rest of that game I was taking any mission that let me kill bandits, even if the pay was terrible. I really did try to avenge you, Blitz. When you leave a city, several different things can happen, too. You can run into bandits on motorcycles that you gotta block, a stampede of zombie animals that you have to avoid, or you have to ford a horde of zombies rather than a river. Or in the middle of a trip, you might have to defend yourself from zombies surrounding you on the road. Like I said, you need lots of ammo. Why can't I just drive away from the zombies surrounding me again? There's plenty of room to drive. Speaking of which, how come none of your party has guns besides you? So eventually you make it to safe haven, and you need to collect gas cans to power the generator to get in, left for dead 2 now, and- Hey, wait a minute, they have guns now! Where are those guns during the rest of the game? Oh, I guess they show up when you're fording zombies. Granted, they're not doing much in this final segment, but it's something. Why can't anyone else use these guns to help earlier? Oh, and now if someone dies, they get replaced! All the rules changed! 
Okay, well that would be nice to have your party actually help or be able to change between them during the rest of the game. But still, the way it is, it's like an expanded version of the original Oregon Trail. With zombies. And no history lessons at all, so it's not really even educational anymore. It's still a fun game, though. It's surprisingly deep and varied for what it is. Lots of upgrades, lots of events. There's a few things that bug me about it, but overall... I'd say I actually like it as much as the original Oregon Trail. Through the rose-tinted glasses of nostalgia, even. There's also some amusing things in the extras, like Clement's Quest. This is basically an action version of Oregon Trail where you drive to Safe Haven and back for some reason. This part's kind of meh, and I've never really gotten past it, but it's just a silly bonus thing anyway, so I can't exactly complain too much about it. Getting trapped in between zombies is kind of stupid, though. Where are my guns? Then there's the survival mode that got added in later in the game's lifespan. Ironically, just like every survival mode in games, you will not be surviving in this mode. Basically, you pick a starting loadout and you try to survive for as long as you can and get as far as you can before you all die. It's actually kind of irritating to me because the game doesn't get harder, you just get less and less supplies when you scavenge until you just die with a little whimper rather than a big bang. I just don't like this mode much. They try to give it some replayability by letting you complete objectives to collect skulls to get different loadouts and modifications, but it just bugs me because there's no goal so it just feels really pointless. Oh, and uh, don't name the people after anyone you care about if you play on survival mode. Especially if you have an overactive imagination. Survival mode for me ended up being the sad little tale of a ragtag group of friends driving over 25,000 miles about the circumference of the earth, looking for a safe place to settle and, well, failing. Did I mention that survival mode game, which was the only one I played, took me about five hours? Whereas a normal game takes about one or two? Yeah. That's another reason survival mode bugs me, it takes way too long. Though I think the snow cone machine really, really helped prolong that. Also, I'm apparently in the top ten scores for survival mode, so there is that, that's kinda cool. There is no chance for anyone normal to get on the leaderboard for the normal game mode, though. Damn hackers. Seriously, you people that hack games are just pathetic. Let the people who are actually trying to get good at it get on the leaderboards and feel good about themselves. You assholes. So, survival mode aside, I recommend checking this out just for the normal game. I actually think I like it better than the original Oregon Trail. That might be blasphemy, but I'm gonna say it anyways. This is Tanara Kuranov signing off, and if this game is any indication, me and my friends could totally rock the zombie apocalypse.
You know, speaking of the Mythbusters... We're going to test the myth that you can survive the zombie apocalypse and travel across the country using only an old station wagon and the supplies that you can scavenge in only four hours. Remember, we're professionals, and we do this for a living. Do not try this at home. Ever! <laughs>